Once again, from the Higher Grounds Podcast, this is Brother Wilson, and this is the Big K's Corner. I want you to enjoy yourself today as we study the Word of God, and I want you to find your Bible, get you a pen, pencil, piece of paper, and study the Word of God with us. We began on our first broadcast in the book of 1 John, dealing with the idea of what causes doubt, the areas in life, the ways in life that we have to uh, bide our time in this world until Jesus comes, some things that can creep in and take over, and before long you're in a big way of doubting. Now, we're not going to rehash all that, but let me just let you that may not have seen the broadcast, as well as those that had, we remind you, and let you know where we got to in 1 John chapter number 3. Now, we're not doing 1 John in chronological order, but we're doing it by topic. And we looked in 1 John chapter 3 from the standpoint of the Word of God as how God views sin is how the believer's attitude towards sin ought to be. And we, we studied, first of all, that there is the compromise of sin, which is very, very evident all around us today, things that are clearly outlined in the Bible that should not be a part of a believer's life have made its way in. And I know you've heard heard much preaching regarding that. If it's in your life today, we want you to know God wants you to live in victory. The compromise of sin is what we call the toleration of sin. We can accept it because we've distanced ourselves from it in the area of accountability. And then we studied on the idea of the comfort in sin. Comfort in sin comes basically by the longer you do it or the longer that you're in the presence of of it, eventually you will go to what we call the acceptation of sin. And beloved, when you accept sin as a part of your life, you're in dangerous, dangerous ground because if you've been saved, and that is the whole thought of 1 John's writing, if you've been saved and you've been identified as the, the children of God, one of the children of God, and you have accepted sin, there is no escape from chastity. It is guaranteed. It's going to happen. And God doesn't want to do it, but we studied and we realized we don't have time to rehash all that, but it is a token of God's love is the chastisement. Chastisement is severe when it has to be a scourging. And I encourage you, run from sin, flee from it. If you want help, God will, God will give it to you as he offers it to all of his children. The third thing is what we really really bore down on and studied in verse 8 and 9 and 10 of 1 John chapter number 3, and that is the continuing to sin. And that's kind of where we left off. Because the continuing of sin is that uh, the idea that a, a believer has committed a sin and has become accustomed to that sin, that it not only can become a habit, it can become a literal addiction. It can consume you. It can be any particular sin, but sin in general. This is what we call the justification of sin. When you begin to justify sin, things happen in your life. And here's what I mean by that. When you justify uh, sin, you start finding yourself very passive. You start allowing yourself to be engrossed by that which should repulse you. It should absolutely uh, astound you and, and cause you a sense of awe and shame. But unfortunately, if you commit sin long enough, it will become a, a pit in your life and you'll end up nurturing things that should have been neutered a long time ago. When you justify sin, here's what you're saying. I don't care what anyone says. This is the way I see it. That is the problem. That is why I call this particular first two messages the theme of it being 
the believer's attitude toward sin. We in America especially, our American churches, we have lost the idea of looking at sin or even what is right, not just what is wrong, but looking at righteousness and ungodliness from both perspectives, we have quit looking at it through the lens of the Word of God. And when we do that, and we become defensive, and when we become defensive, there's always going to be confusion, and when there's confusion, there's every work of evil. You come to a place where you not only promote it, but you condemn those that are against it. This is the, the biggest battle that has, has transpired in ministry over the, at least in my saved life. I've been saved 44 years and I was saved in a time when there was a constant battle between the pulpit and the pew. And one of the battles that I saw fought that should never have been fought is the men of God legislating your life. Now, there is always the need to preach the Word of God unashamedly without any compromise whatsoever. However, no matter how hard a pastor tries, you cannot make a person do anything if it's not in their heart to do it. And if you do, and people start picking up things in their life strictly because it's the accustomed way, if you are this particular church or this particular denomination or whatever, when that happens, eventually those people will pick those sin habits back up that you coerced them to let go of, and they'll resent you. You cannot make it happen. However, let me say this. If a man of God is preaching, and you know he's got the book, and God has given the unctionizing witness that God's touch is on him, his faith follows his, his preaching, his works admonish him, he's commended in Scripture worthy of double honor, you better heed what that man's saying. Beloved, the men of God, I'm talking about true men of God, when they preach on sin, they're not trying to exalt themselves they're trying to expose areas in life that's going to make shipwreck of the faith in your life. And no, none of us want to see that happen. There's none of us that uh, rejoice in the, it's not the idea. It's not the idea that a man of God sees someone do against his advice. And if they fall and they get in a bad way, that man of God does not say, see, I told you so. That's not the idea at all. It's the very truth of the, uh, and the essence of it is this. He's commanded by God to teach the children of God the difference between the profane and the holy. And that's done by scriptural preaching. And if this book offends you, then you're in a bad way. You're just in a bad way, and, and uh, uh, the big kahuna cannot help you on that. You're going to have to get that squared away with God. Now, let's look in chapter 3 at sin defined. What is sin? Without giving a description of a particular sin, here's what the Bible said. In 1 John 3, verse number 4, the Bible says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Now look at that word also. That word also means there's at least two things, possibly more, but there's at least two things taking place. He committeth and he transgresseth. He committeth sin and he transgresseth the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Again this week, I want to define this and describe this to you in such a way that it is of the nature of simplicity to understand. A lot of people make, make a do out of stuff that's just simple to understand if you don't complicate it with your oratory skills, all right? So with no further ado, here's what transgressing the law is. God wrote it. And a book. Now, he did that through the penmanship of men, but those men 
row and spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why we call the Word of God inspired. When God gave the law, the law was given to give sin a descriptive category. Now notice what Paul said in Romans 5. He said, before there was a law, there was sin. Now, we do not know anything about the, the, the time of people from the creation of Adam and Eve unto the flood. But before that time, they knew right from wrong because the Bible said Enoch walked with God. And if Enoch was walking with God, that means it was the possibility of not walking with God. All right? So God had some kind of parameters out there and how he revealed that God did not give us scripture. There is a little portion in Hebrews chapter one that talks about the word of God, the spirit of God, and then finally the son of God and God progressively revealed himself. Now listen carefully. God didn't show Adam what he showed Abraham and God didn't show Abraham what he showed Moses. As we go forward in time, the word of God continues to reveal God himself to humanity and especially to the believer. When we come to the very end of the Bible, God basically says in the apocalypse or the revelation of Christ, he basically says, and I said all that to say this. And he gives us three categories. He told John to wrote the things that were, the things that are, and the things that shall be. And, and 15 of those book, or chapters in Revelation, 15 of those chapters deal with explicit amounts of description of sin to the point, beloved, that he even says they shake their fist and blaspheme God and gnaw their tongues in pain when all God was doing was trying to move them to repentance. Now, we don't have time to belabor that. Here's what I want you to understand. When God defined sin, he gave it a name. We know that, that gambling is wrong. We know that lust is wrong. We know that this and that and the other is wrong because God gave a law. Now, you take the umbrella of the Ten Commandments and underneath that are all sorts of categories in sins, okay? We know that the Bible said uh, that, that a man should not lie with man. Now, we call that homosexuality. God simply said, this is an abomination. So that tells me that there are sins, and then there are gross sins, and then there are abominable sins. There are abominations. All sin is transgressing the law, but the law reveals the degree of the degenerate nature inside all of us. Now, beloved, here's the scary part. Are you listening? You listen to this preacher. I'll try to help you if you let me. Here's the scary part about that. When the believer ceases to have the right attitude towards sin, what he will soon learn or she will soon learn, uh, I pray sooner than later, is that that wicked heart inside of you is still wicked. Okay? God did not remove the, the Adamic nature from us when we got saved. When you got saved, you became two. And those two war one against the other, the spirit man and the old man. They constantly struggle, and they're wanting to enthrone themselves on your heart. That, that is the seat of your will, your decision-making. If your flesh resides in control, Romans 6 and 7 deals with this very clearly. If your flesh uh, resides in control, you're going to still be hearing the voice of God if you've ever been saved. You're still going to know the conviction of God's Holy Ghost if you've ever been saved. But beloved, if you stay in that sin for a very long period of time, you're going to lose sight that sin is transgressing the law of God. 
God. In other words, you're going to be looking at it in one dimension. You're not going to look at it from the perspective of God. You're going to look at it from, it's my business. God hasn't convicted me of that yet. That's the pastor's opinion. You're going to have all these little cliches. Literally what you're saying is, I don't want to hear the law of God. I don't want to learn it. I don't want to read it. I don't want to study it. I don't want to live it. I want to do what I want to do. That is pride, and that is the epitome of a sure destruction. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This thing is not a human opinion. It is the inerrant, eternal, infallible Word of God. And it's not all about the do's and the don'ts. I hear that all the time, all the time. Liberal-minded people that are part of my life uh, with whatever relation or connection we have. You hear it all the time. That's just one way of looking at it. You know what you're doing? You are trying to say that God wrote one Bible for me and one Bible for this man and one. Listen, the same qualifications, quote unquote, of a bishop should be normal behavior for the member. If you've ever been saved by the grace of God, just because God said all these things are in certain order for the man of God, they're a mandate, it should be in your heart to live as close to God as your pastor or any other good preacher or missionary or whatever that you may know. As a matter of fact, you should be surrounding yourself with people of that caliber of life. So sin is defined. And verse number nine, sin is denounced. In verse number nine of First John chapter three, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed. Now, beloved, we studied that on the first broadcast. If you missed it, go back to the archives and the Higher Grounds uh, podcast, and you can get it. Now, here's what he said. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Why? Because he is born of God. Now, and, and, and this, this really, really is much, much uh, deeper in, in, in doctrinal theology than I have oratory skills to communicate. I cannot convey to you how profound that verse is. I wish I could do it justice. But here's what God is saying. You did not pick up a new walk. You didn't turn over a leaf. You didn't make a resolution or resolve yourself that you're no longer going to do these things. That's not what happened. You were recreated you were born of God, that you were born again. You were born of your mother. You were of your father's seed, whomever they may be on the humanity side. But on the spiritual side, you were born of God. Does your life reflect one that is a part of God's family. Now, if you look at God's family just on one dimension, going to church and doing this and that, doing churchy things, then you're, you're going to miss the whole picture. You're going to miss the entire concept of 1 John 3, 9. Now, we've already covered in, the, in our uh, last broadcast, we already covered that that committing sin is an ongoing, continuous, with uh, no intention of changing, none whatsoever. The reason that that is unacceptable is because the Spirit of God birthed you. Listen. When God the Holy Ghost impregnated your soul with the seed of the gospel and there was an incubation of conviction and you were birthed into the family of God by the word of God, beloved, you came forth a righteous creature. You were created in the image of God and that is dealing with the, 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 the trinity of man and so forth and so on. But when you were born again, you were created in the nature of Christ. That means inside of you, there is a righteous nature. In other words, it is in you to want to do right. Now, hear me well. 
When you deal with the idea of doubt, and I have, I, I have seen this uh, many, many times in 30 years of ministry, I have seen very, very uh, horrible mind battles that people find themselves in. Now, beloved, listen to me. I'm going to be very plain. I'm going to be very honest, but I'm going to be very scriptural. A lot of those those hard-fought battles come from a seed of sin. Somewhere sin embedded itself. It may be carried over from your lifestyle, however you live, but I've also, listen to me, I, I've had men, I've had men, beloved, that have told me that they were, they were in themselves convinced that they had blasphemed the Holy Ghost and that, that was the end. I've had, I've seen them with suicidal tendencies. I've seen, listen, there was a time, there was a time when a young couple came to my church and they had made a pact with their, with their, uh, the father and the mother of the daughter and the wife, the son's father-in-law, they had twins. They were going to raise the twins. And beloved, listen to me. These two people had made a pact. They were going to co commit suicide together because they were in such a mind. Their mind was so controlled by the devil. You say, well, uh, I just don't believe a saved man can get in that shape. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what your flesh can do to you. Now, listen to me. They didn't kill themselves, but do you know within a matter of three years, both of those were dead? And both of those died not of any self-inflicted thing whatsoever. Uh, as a matter of fact, oddly as it may seem, they both died in automobile wrecks. They both did, died in automobile wrecks. Within three years of sitting in my office in North Carolina, the first church ever pastored, and telling me those thoughts were, how'd you get there? Let's start from there. What is going on? There's got to be. And you know what it was? They each were toying with perversion, and they each found themselves in a bad, bad mental state. You say, preacher, what are you saying? When a saved person insists that they're going to go against God and they're going to have their own, uh, their own self-willed life, beloved, when God said in First John, or excuse me, First Corinthians five, to turn one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, beloved, that's holy language. That's heavenly and holy language that is being thrown at someone with a hellish lifestyle. That's very serious. Of course you're going to have doubts when you partake of those wicked things. God's not, uh, uh, not going to uh, make it less for you just because uh, for some reason you're going to get a buy. I can do this and get by. I can do this and get by. You're listening to the voice of your carnal nature and your baser nature has taken the throne of your heart, and, and you're going to end up in a way, you're going to want out and can't get out. You've heard those sayings, sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you ever thought it was going to cost. And God denounced it. How did he denounce it? Because he said a saved person does not continually commit sin with no intention of stopping or repenting and not suffer severe dire consequences. And then we see that sin is deceitful. I want to read a, a verse in chapter 1 of 1 John, and I want to read verse number 8. And here's what the Bible said. Sin is denounced. Sin has been defined. But here sin is deceitful. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, that is, we're going to deal with this when we get to chapter number 1, but that is a plural first person pronoun we. So John is placing himself 
himself in verse 8. And John is saying, if we say that we have no sin. Now, now there is the simple, most common definition, or not definition, that's the wrong word. The description and the explanation of that verse usually goes by this. Everybody sins, and therefore, we cannot say that we're sinless. I understand that. I understand that. I believe that. I teach that. Well, I don't teach it. The Bible teaches it. I just preach what thus saith the Lord's word. And that is very, very, uh, that you're doing scripture no harm whatsoever. But I want you to understand something. Beloved, there's a deeper meaning here. And there is a deeper warning here. There is a stronger urgency than just saying everybody that is saved has the likeliness that you're going to mess up. I understand that. But I want you to see a, a phrase here. The Bible said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, here's what I want you to understand. You deceive yourself, not beloved, by saying we've never sinned or since the day we've been saved or after we were saved after a period of time. I know what the apostolic church teaches and I wish them no harm and I know what the church of the Nazarene doctrine is and I wish them no harm, none whatsoever. But when you get to a place you deceive yourself, what you have done is you have said my sin is acceptable. And beloved, there is no greater point of deception that a believer will ever find himself in or herself in than when they say that they can sin and that sin is acceptable in a Christian's life. It's not. It cannot be. It never will be. There's never a day that God is going to change his mind on sin. Now, the particular sins and the identification of sin, uh, we get into all these debates. This is wrong. This is not. This is wrong. This is not. I can do this, but I can't do that. Well, you might can do it, but I can't do it. I've never seen any more comical of a situation than to see two people debating on how close to the world they can live and still be all right with God. That's yeah. that's uh, ludicrous. Uh, beloved, that's not scriptural thinking at all. Uh, that's heretical doctrine. That's heresy, and you should stay away from that. But I want you to understand this as we bring this broadcast to an end. I want you to understand there is no greater deception than self-deception. When you get to a place that you are deceiving yourselves, you're opening the Pandora box of doubting the reality of salvation. I'm going to ask you to be prayerful, and the next broadcast we're going forward and showing you how to conquer the consequences of sin because that's the road that God wants to believe her on, and it'll lead you to assurance and an abundance of joy. This this is Brother Wilson. This is the Big Case Corner. I want you to have a glorious, glorious week. All this weekend in the house of God, have a great time. We're going to meet again on the next broadcast, and we're going to see the consequences of sin from the believer's idea of conquering that sin. What does the Bible say? Until next time, this is the Big Kahuna. I want you to have a blessed day until we meet again.